It is now time for oral questions. Now time for oral questions. The member for Brampton Centre. This question is about the Premier's standards for Cabinet and how he communicates those standards. Last Friday, in a late night statement, the Premier stated the question is for the Premier, sorry, Speaker. Uh, last Friday, in a late night statement, the Premier stated that the MPP for Simcro Gray would be leaving Cabinet and the PC caucus to deal with personal addiction issues. Was that the real reason for his dismissal? Premier. Well, through you, Mr. Speaker. I'm actually surprised this question has come up again. My job is to make sure I protect everyone in our party, everyone under this roof of Queen's Park. Here, here. We've acted decisively. And my job is to protect, when someone comes forward with an allegation, is to protect them. Not to worry about what the opposition, the NDP, or the media is worried about. I know maybe the NDP, Mr. Speaker, takes a different approach on this. Maybe they believe in not protecting their staff, not protecting their members. We have a different approach. We, we believe in making sure that we have a, a work environment that is safe for everyone. I have zero tolerance for that behavior. We acted decisively. It takes a lot of courage to speak Response. truth to power. And it's, I just find it ironic that they bring this up, throwing stones in a glass house which we won't get into about the NDP, but again, thank you. Thank you. Stop the clock. Order. Order. Start the clock. Supplementary. Speaker, the Premier has since admitted that the real reason for the dismissal from Cabinet was sexual harassment and misconduct. The Premier also claimed that he hid those facts because he was concerned that the media would disclose the name of the individual who came forward. But the journalists have reported on this incident for over a week, and no names, no names have been disclosed. So why did the Premier offer a different reason for the resignation on Friday than the one he's offering to us today? Premier. Actually, through you, Mr. Speaker, the media did mention the Chief of Staff at, uh, the minute about uh, the Minister's office. Again, I'm going to repeat what I said earlier. We, we are here to make sure we protect everyone. And everyone that comes forward with an allegation, I'm here to tell them they will be protected. I'm not worried about the media. The media are smart folks. They'd pick it up in about three seconds. And once it did come out, they did pick it up in about three seconds. It's not about keeping the NDP happy. It's not about keeping the media happy. It's about protecting the people that have the courage to come forward with these allegations. Members, please take your seats. Final supplementary. Speaker, speaker um, protecting a victim of sexual misconduct is the right thing to do. Protecting a powerful man accused of sexual misconduct is not. Pretending that those things are at odds with each other is the wrong thing to be doing. As the Premier well knows, the allegations of sexual misconduct are now a matter of public record. And journalists have done their job without exposing the victims to any harm or scrutiny. Will the Premier admit that this attempt to sweep this serious incident under the rug was a mistake? And going forward, will he commit to taking immediate and also transparent action when dealing with allegations of sexual misconduct here in the House? Premier. Through you, Mr. Speaker, the person that came forward with the allegations asked us over and over again to be protected, not to say a word. So that person trumps everyone else. Exactly. Trumps everyone else. I, I find it pretty shameful that the member from Brampton would even keep bringing this up. This, this house here, Queen's Park, should be a safe working environment. I have zero tolerance that behavior. We acted decisively, and we will always act decisively. Next question, the leader for Brampton Centre. The member for Brampton Centre. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, this question is also to the Premier. 
This is a question about the Premier's standards for Cabinet ministers. Two weeks ago, the Premier stated that he had absolute confidence in the new Minister of Tourism, who was, at the time, serving as the Minister of Public Safety. In fact, the Premier didn't just express confidence, he claimed, and I quote, 1,000 per cent confidence in the Minister. Yet the Premier moved him to a different job mere days after saying that. Can the Premier tell us? On a scale of one to a thousand percent, exactly how confident are you and your minister this week? Premier, through, through, through you, Speaker, I'm ten thousand. I just multiplied it by ten. Ten thousand. With all our ministers, with our team, the PC government has ended up getting more things done than any yeah, yeah. government in the history of Ontario. It's been unprecedented. Unprecedented. Unbelievable. Watch that again. Beautiful. I just wish, I just wish once, Mr. Speaker, the NDP would come up and come up with some tax savings rather than always thinking about attacking our party personally, attacking ministers personally, we're recalibrated our team to make sure Spons. the people in, the, in their area are going to fit that area. We are going to constantly make sure we respect the taxpayers yeah, until yeah. we can make sure we continue lowering taxes, lowering hydro rate. Thank you. Sure Thank you. Start the clock. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. There have been serious concerns raised about the new Minister of Tourism. As the minister responsible for the OPP, he campaigned for a candidate at the centre of an OPP investigation, Speaker. He's currently embroiled in multiple lawsuits, and he played a central role in a $40 million Ponzi scheme that built people out of their life savings. Media reports that the Premier was not happy about those revelations, and that led the minister to be moved to a new portfolio. If the Premier does not have confidence in this minister, why is he still a minister in this cabinet? Premier. Through you, Speaker, again, I want to tell you, this is the best cabinet, best caucus this province has ever seen. Ever. You don't have policy, you go personal. We have a team. We, we have a team that's turning this province around, respecting taxpayers, making sure we talk about the things that matter here, here. to the people of Ontario. We aren't here to attack personally like the NDP does because they have no policy to go by. We're here to make sure that we turn the province around, we start paying down the $15 billion structural debt deficit. We're making sure that we're lowering taxes, lowering gas prices, which everyone talked about this Lots. week on how low the, uh, the, the gas prices were. Uh, when I've crisscrossed this province over the last couple of weeks, Mr. Speaker, I've heard nothing but positive comments. Here, here. Keep going. Keep going. Thank you. Stop the clock. Start the clock. Final supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The Premier, the Premier is supposed to set the standard for his team, and there have been serious concerns and Order. questions raised about the former Minister of Public Safety. And the Premier's solution was not to move him out of Cabinet, but to move him to a different job. The Ontario Government Security side, Commission come to order. said that they found disturbing aspects in this minister's behaviour during discussions in which farm families were talked into investing thousands of dollars that they never got back. So the question to the Premier is, does that meet your standard? Premier. The Minister of Tourism was instrumental, was instrumental in creating Italian Heritage Month. Here, here. He's a, he's a champion when it comes to heritage. He's a champion when it comes to tourism. And we'll, I, I predict we'll have more tourists next year in 2019 than we've ever had in Ontario because of the great work the minister is going to do.
order. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Brampton Centre. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. This question is for the Premier. The Ontario Ombudsman reported at least a thousand complaints about the provincial. Um, uh, sorry, a thousand complaints were made to the provincial ombudsman about the Ontario cannabis store in just a few weeks. The avalanche of complaints were about problems with deliveries, the website, customer service, packaging, Order. shipping, and much more. Not all just Canada Post-related issues. And according to media reports, the OCS warehouse and shipping is being operated by a private company that was contracted through the Ontario Cannabis Store. So my question to the Premier is, was this private company and who is this private company that is running our cannabis store? Premier, Minister of Finance. Minister of Finance. Thank you very much. Well, certainly uh, uh, we're grateful for the question. It's always uh, a great opportunity to stand in this legislature and speak. The first thing we have to absolutely acknowledge that our cannabis sales in Ontario are all about the safety of our children, the safety of our roads, and curbing the illicit market. That's what our cannabis sales here in Ontario are all about. The Ontario Cannabis Store has assured us that they are now on uh, schedule, back to the original schedule. You know, you have to appreciate that we have had prohibition in Ontario for over 100 years. We took this uh, federally legislated law and uh, opened an unprecedented business in, this, in the province of Ontario. Response. Here we are with 100,000 orders on the very first night, so I'll be able to speak more to our uh, advances in the supplementary. In the supplementary. You know, I asked a, a pretty simple question, and I think we deserve to hear a straight answer. There are major, major problems with this very lucrative business, uh, through you, Mr. Speaker, to the minister. And apparently, there are several concerns um, with respect to mislabeling of, of that product. So I, I know we're talking about keeping children safe, but if we're mislabeling products, I'd like to know how the safety aspect of that plays into that. But apparently, the premier has privatized a part of the Ontario cannabis store and given out a big contract without telling the people of Ontario who got that contract and how they got it. Of course, a massive, lucrative contract like this should only be awarded through a tender and competitive bidding order. process. So again, to the Premier, was this contract tendered, and what private company is running Ontario cannabis warehouse operations in this province? Minister Finance. Thank you very much uh, again for the question. Uh, I have to repeat a little bit about what I said, Speaker. Uh, we have taken uh, this federally legislated law and created the, uh, un, uh, the opportunity now to have online sales in, in the province of Ontario. You have to appreciate, of course, Speaker, that uh, when we took office, much of the uh, structure had already been established by the previous government, and although there were uh, many issues that needed correction, uh, that was one that we uh, are, were actually satisfied, Speaker, that the uh, public or the private operation, the private operation of the uh, warehouse is, is in good hands, Speaker. Uh, we are very pleased. Again, this is uncharted territory Bonds. where we have created a company from scratch uh, in a business that no one's been in for a hundred years. Yeah. Next question, the member for Barry Springwater, Oral Medante. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Just yesterday, on Remembrance Day, Ontarians came together all over the province to commemorate and honour our Canadian Armed Forces. Each year on November 11th and throughout Remembrance Week, we pause to pay tribute to those who have served and continue to serve our country during times of war, conflict and peace. Mr. Speaker, we all know the immense sacrifices that our veterans have made to guarantee our safety, our values, and our freedoms, and the sacrifices that our Canadian Armed Forces continue to make today. Can the minister tell the House how this government paid tribute to our Canadian Armed Forces on Remembrance Day? Minister of Tourism, Culture, and Sport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank you to the member for Springwater Oral Medante for this important question. This Re Remembrance Day, uh, Mr. Speaker, and throughout Remembrance Week. Our government launched a campaign to honour our heroic Canadian Armed Forces. 
from the world wars through to modern day conflicts, including the war in Afghanistan, we remember the lives of those Canadians who fought valiantly to protect our great country. This year, we encouraged all Ontarians to take part in Remembrance Week activities and Remembrance Day ceremonies to commemorate 100 years since the end of the First World War and the signing of the Armistice. This Remembrance Week, Ontarians wore poppies, attended ceremonies across the province, and observed a moment of silence Response. at 11 a.m. I am proud to stand in the House today and share our thanks to all the men and women who have fought to preserve our values and our freedoms. Hey, hey. Stop the clock. Start the clock. Supplementary. Thank you to the Minister for that response. I'm glad to hear about our government's hard work to commemorate and honour veterans this Remembrance Day. Whether they served in the First World War, the Second World War, the Korean War, the war in Afghanistan, or any other conflict, the men and women of the Canadian Forces represent the very best of our country, our people, and our values. They deserve our gratitude and respect. During the Remembrance Week campaign, our message reviewed focus, renewed focus on the heroes of the war in Afghanistan, including the 159 Canadians who never made it home. In fact, the Premier and our government have announced plans to build a war memorial to the veterans of the war in Afghanistan. Would the Minister please elaborate on our government's campaign for Ontarians this past Remembrance Day? Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for that important question. Our campaign focused on the heroism of the Canadian Armed Forces who have served in many capacities throughout our country's history. This Remembrance Week served as a stark reminder that to serve your country in a time of war is to take great risks on your country's behalf. We asked Ontarians this year to find their moment of silence with a renewed focus on thanking our Afghan veterans for their sacrifices. We are proud to support our Canadian veterans, and that's why we announced a new memorial honouring Canadians who served in Afghanistan. And as of last week, Mr. Speaker, we committed to ensuring that Ontario legions are exempt from paying property response. Taxes. We also, we also uh, Mr. Speaker, announced our plans to create a dedicated support line for military family support. Next question, Member for Essex. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, there are serious questions surrounding the Premier's role in preserving integrity and respect for Ontario's electoral process. Last week, we learned that police had made two arrests in their investigation into potential PC voter fraud in the riding of Hamilton West and Castor Dundas. As we know, Speaker, the Premier has said that cleaning up the mess in his own party is a top priority. Can the Premier tell us who these individuals are and what their connection to the PC Party of Ontario is? Well, through, through Premier, you, Mr. Speaker, the member knows exactly Exactly. It had nothing to do with us, nothing to do with me. I was elected to be the PC leader to clean up Patrick Brown's mess, and it was a mess, and that's exactly what we're doing. And I, 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 have, I, I cannot get involved, as you know, Mr. Speaker, I can't get involved in any police investigation. I have all the confidence in the world in the Chief of Hamilton, and I'm sure this is all going to come forward. And again, I was elected to clean up the mess. That's what our team is doing, and that's what our team has done. Thank you. Stop the clock. I, I would remind the member that the question has to deal with government policy. The supplementary has to deal with government policy. And he should phrase his question as such. And if it's not, we'll have to move on. Go ahead. Speaker, as the PC party heads into their convention this weekend, there are serious questions about the operation of the Premier's party. There's an ongoing police investigation into a data breach at the 407, which forced the resignation. We're going to have to move on. Next question, the member for Flamborough Glanville. For 
the Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Yesterday, Canadians across this country and throughout this province gathered at Cenotaph City Halls and memorials to honour those who gave their lives right. so that we could live in a safe, free and democratic country. Absolutely. Speaker, Canadians continue to serve in our armed forces around the world and here at home, ensuring we live safely. Service in the military comes with significant challenges for both service members and their families. We know that military families move on average three times more often than other Canadian families. As we reflect on the sacrifices of Canadian soldiers from the beaches of Dieppe to the hills of Kandahar, Minister, can you update this legislature on the action our government is taking to make life easier for service members and their families here at home? What a great question. Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank my honourable colleague for her excellent question. I'm sure all members of this House, while attending memorial events across our great province yesterday, reflected on the sacrifice our service men and women face not only in conflict zones around the world, but on a day-to-day -day basis here at home. I myself have heard firsthand about these challenges from military families across our province. That is why I'm very proud to inform the Legislature that our Government for the People is launching consultations with military families, stakeholders and other jurisdictions to hear from them what we can do to support military families when moving to Ontario. Our goal is to establish a one-stop shop hotline for military families who make Ontario home. When they move here, they can call this hotline and they can get information they need about schooling, childcare, automobile licensing, healthcare and much, much more. By speaking with, and more importantly, Mr. Speaker, listening to Spons. military families, we can learn exactly what challenges they face and how best we can help make their lives that much easier. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, members and their families give so much and are willing to give it all for us and our safety. This is just one way we can give something here, back. Here. Stop the clock. Restart the clock. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, I am so proud to hear our government listening directly to servicemen and women and their families. We can only properly address their challenges by listening directly to the people most affected by them. It is said that when a soldier serves, his or her entire family serves. Military families face significant challenges, particularly when forced to relocate from community to community and from province to province. Child care, schooling, spousal employment, even having to change health cards and driver's licenses. Military families can often feel separated from their new homes and overwhelmed with this long list of day-to-day -day challenges. Minister, can you tell me what our government is doing to help mitigate these challenges for military families who call Ontario home? Great question. Minister. Sure you, Mr. Speaker. I want to assure the honourable member that helping make life easier for members of our armed forces is a top priority for this government. Service members are willing to give it all to keep us safe and free. We will do whatever we can to make sure their families are taken care of here at home. Here, here. Key to this is the establishment of the one-stop shop hotline I mentioned earlier. By first conducting consultations, we will be able to create a hotline that addresses the challenges military families face when they move here to Ontario. Right now, military families can go to Ontario.ca slash military families to participate in consultations and also to learn more about the existing programs we have in place to make life a little bit easier for them when they arrive in Ontario from abroad or another province. We will report back in early 2019 on the results of these consultations. Mr. Speaker, whether it's our one-stop shot hotline, cost-free fishing, here, or the here. removal of property taxes from Legion Halls, these are small Bonds. but important steps we are making as the government of, of Doug Ford to, to here, give here. back to those who serve our country every day. Here, here. Restart the clock. Next question, the member for Hamilton Mountain. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Autistic children should not have to suffer when changing from the direct service option to the direct funding option, but they are. Talasika, the mother of six-year-old Kevin Samalingham, who lives with autism, unfortunately knows this all too well. Extremely unhappy with the lack of service her son was receiving from Canark, Talasika requested a move 
to DFO from DSO in July. She was told she would be placed on a transfer wait list. In July, he was 28th on the list. Today, he is still 28th on the list. Wow. Speaker, when will this government step in to ensure that Kevin's story does not become the norm? Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. I'd like to congratulate the member opposite be for being the first in nine questions on the other side of the House to talk about something substantive the people of Ontario actually want to know about, rather than getting into the mud and into the ditches. I want to say to Telesica that we have inherited a situation in the province of Ontario with respect to autism services that, uh, that really doesn't put compassion and children at the forefront. We're guided by compassion in the Ontario Progressive Conservative Caucus for families struggling to provide sure. their kids with proven autism diagnostic for and behavioral come to order. services. Government House Leader, come to order. This government made a campaign commitment to invest $100 million in autism services over the course of our mandate, and we plan to keep that promise. Premier Ford is focused on providing better outcomes and better lives for the people Fox. we serve by working in consultation with service providers, and I'll have more to say in the supplementary. supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. As you heard from the minister, the Ford government ran on a platform that promised that they would add $100 million in funding in 2018 and 19 to the Ontario Autism Program. However, We have to stop the clock when there's a standing ovation. But the standing ovation should not be used to interrupt an opposition member's question. Order. I'm going to give the member for Hamilton Mountain extra time. Start the clock. Member for Hamilton Mountain. Instead of using pom poms, maybe they should make sure that kids in this province have the services they need. Speaker, families are so disappointed in the direct service option that many of them are transferring to the direct funding option. Currently, there are approximately 50 children on Canarc's transfer wait list who are waiting for direct funding, and this is completely unacceptable. Speaker, when the OAP came into place, there was no transfer waiting list, and this government has allowed that to happen. Children living with autism should receive quality, timely services. Will this government honour its commitment and finally release the much-needed autism funding? Minister. Well, Speaker, we have, and I can tell you, we're not the party that 97 per cent of the time stood there and defended the former Liberal government who took parents of autism to court. Yeah. Members of this party, including our Minister of Health and myself, Opposition have been on the, field order. the ground for over 12 years supporting those families with autism. Come to order. She started the Ability Centre. I started the South European Autism Centre. Why? Because the party that they're aligned with cut autism funding. They, the party that they're aligned with so didn't support the parents of autistic children, but we've taken a Member different for approach. Waterloo, That's why my parliamentary assistant, Amy Fee, is leading consultations on autism. That's why my next-door neighbor, Jeremy Roberts, is leading consultations within our party on autism. And that's why Robin Martin is working with parents in the Ministry of Health to support parents with autism. So I can tell the member opposite, we made a promise, we intend to keep it. Next question, the member for Ottawa, Vanier. Minister, there are many issues in Ontario today that require immediate attention. I have many questions for different ministries because 
Question period is supposed to be a forum for accountability, not just a cheerleading for government. The co-op movement is waiting for answers from the Minister of Finance. Tenants and condo owners are waiting for a year from the new Minister of Consumer and Government Services about the way elevators will be kept in good state of repair. And last week, a, a family physician in my riding came to express his concerns as to the position of the government in this negotiation with the OMA. The government position is to cut the funding for preventative care for physicians. This funding currently ensures that family physicians do preventative care, such as childhood immunization, pap screening for cervical cancer, mammograms for breast cancers, flu vaccination. Does the Premier think that it will be good for Ontario to diminish preventative care for vaccination and cancer screening? Premier. Minister. Okay. Min Minister of Health, I guess. I, I, like, I, Minister of Health and I don't know. Well, I can't answer all aspects of your question, but I can uh, answer your questions with respect to health. Uh, with respect to the OMA, as the member will know, the matter has gone to arbitration, and that will be decided by the arbitrator. Yep. But we hope that that decision will be made soon because we look forward to working with our partners in health. Doctors are a large part of that to make sure that we transform our system into one that's acceptable for the 21st century that will be sustainable from now into the future. Okay, for our children and grandchildren. <laughs> Supplementary. The official position of the government in this arbitration is to cut preventative care. And that's the concern. Cancer Care Ontario has just released a report stressing that we are making headway and there are measurable results when you invest in prevention. Early detection decreases. This uh, increases the survival rates of cancer. However, let me quote from the report, page 19, chapter 4. Despite the success of screening programs in cervical cancers, still 12%, close to 12% of cases were not diagnosed until stage 4. In good conscience, we would want to continue to invest in the early screening of cervical cancer. The government, the government knows how important it is to have flu shots. It's been advertising it. Flu shots are crucial to uh, decreasing emergency care. Will the Premier commit Question. today to protect preventative medicine from cuts and ensure that primary care practitioners have all the tools that they need to do prevention? Minister. Well, I can't speak to the exact issues that wow. were discussed with the OMA. That is a matter before arbitration now. But I can assure you that what we are looking at is augmenting, building our health care system, not taking anything away from it. And of course, an essential component of that is making sure that people are well, because too often our system is reactive. It waits until people get into a crisis. That's how people end up in hospitals, mental health, cancer, other crises. What we want to do is become more <laughs> proactive, make sure that people take responsibility responsibility for their own care, that they have the early screenings, that they go for regular visits when they need to to their physicians. That's what we're trying to do as we transform our health care system into one that is modern, that is progressive, one that is going to make sure that people are well. We want to become the healthiest Spons. province in Canada, and there's a lot of steps we can take, and we will be taking those this steps. Is our Start the clock. Next question, the member for Kitchener, Conestoga. My question is for the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. The Ontario Hockey League has brought a critical issue to our attention over the past week. In fact, we learned that the future of junior hockey and amateur hockey leagues were at stake. We know, Mr. Speaker, that hockey is an integral part of our culture as Ontarians. We know that the OHL and junior hockey leagues provide crucial training for future NHL players and we take any threats of its future very seriously. Would the minister be able to update this House on the important issue brought to, the, brought to our attention by the Ontario Hockey League? Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Kitchener-Conestoga for that question. 
Mr. Speaker, as you know, I was recently appointed to, appointed to the Ministry of Tourism, Culture yeah, and Sport. Yeah, yeah. I hope that in my role I'll be able to continue the important work that was started by my colleague, Minister Jones, uh, as the previous minister here. As you know, Mr. Speaker, the Ontario Hockey League plays an essential role in the fabric of this province. These teams are the cornerstone of towns and the fabric of our province. I know many of my PC colleagues whose constituencies house OHL teams and proudly wear their jerseys around their communities. This is where many future NHL players refine their game and where even young players are inspired Spots. by their local uh, heroes. We're proud to support the Ontario Hockey League and will continue working together to ensure that we have a vibrant hockey culture in Ontario. Supplementary. Through you, Mr. Speaker, to the Minister, thank you for that response. I am happy to hear that our government is committed to supporting hockey as it is an integral and iconic part of Ontario's cultural fabric. We also know that local Ontario Hockey League teams, like my Kitchener Rangers, are important economic social drivers in their communities. Whether it's Junior A, B, C or two-tier, Junior Hockey is essential to the development and promotion of one of Canada's most important sports. Can the minister elaborate on our government support for the Ontario Hockey League's critical concerns? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank my colleague again for that question. Mr. Speaker, I can tell you that this government is committed to creating the environment for businesses to succeed. Young hockey players across our provinces grow up dreaming of winning the J. Ross Robertson Cup or the Memorial Cup. To be clear, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to reiterate our government's support for the Ontario Hockey League. We will be doing everything in our power to ensure the success of the OHL and junior hockey across the province. Mr. Speaker, we are actively looking at providing clarity to the OHL and we'll have more to say shortly. I want to reassure the OHL and all Ontarians that we are working hard to come to a solution. I look forward, as a new Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport, to reach out in the near future Spots. with a solution that I am sure all Ontarians will support. Thank you. Next question, the member for London, Fanshawe. My question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Can the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care tell the House what a virtual long-term care bed is? Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, thank you very much for the question. As you know, it was one of our primary uh, considerations in the last election to raise more long-term care beds because we have over 30,000 people in Ontario who can't be moved uh, elsewhere. They need a long-term care bed to go to. We have committed to uh, finding 15,000 beds in five years. They don't all have to be bricks and mortar beds. There are other ideas that many groups have come forward with, including step down. Some people may be able to move into a retirement home, for example, with home care around them and then be able to go back to their own homes. That is the ultimate for most people. They would rather go home if they're able to with home care supports. And so we're looking at all possible alternatives with the essential provision that it has to be appropriate for that person it has to be safe and it has to be comfortable for them. Supplementary. There are more than 32,000 people on the wait list for long-term care. Those with high needs and their families can wait years for the care they need today. And the list keeps getting longer. Yet this government has promised just 6,000 beds and they say it'll take five years to do that. And now we're hearing the minister plans to get creative when it comes to planning for more long-term care beds. Speaker, people are worried that getting creative means cutting. It means frontline staff being asked to do even more with even less. So will the minister. So will any of the minister's 6,000 long-term care beds be virtual beds? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Through you, I would like to correct the facts. In fact, what we have promised to the people of Ontario that we will provide is 15,000 beds within five years. We have already announced over 6,000 beds. 
says it will not take five years for those 6,000 beds to come online, but we have promised 15,000 and we will deliver 15,000. But the fact is, because there are over 30,000 people waiting for a long-term care bed, we have to be innovative. We have to think outside the box. We have to make sure that we can find those beds for those people because they deserve it. They deserve it, and the people of Ontario expect us to provide that, and we will. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Simcoe North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Training Colleges and Universities. I know from speaking with employers that we need to do more to fill the skills gap and ensure that our young people and job seekers are given the skills they need to succeed. That is why I am proud that our government has already started to outline its plan to address the skills gap. I have heard fantastic feedback from employers in my riding and across Ontario about the government's legislation, which, if passed, will standardize apprentice to journey person ratios and reduce red tape on businesses by winding down the Ontario College of Trades. Here, here. Speaker, we know that there is a skills gap which costs Ontario's economy $24 billion. At the same time, youth unemployment is consistently double that of the general population. Can the minister tell us more about the steps our government is taking to help increase apprenticeships in Ontario? Mr. Training Colleges and Universities. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Simcoe North for her advocacy for her constituents and job seekers across Ontario. Speaker, the member is absolutely right that our government is taking action to address the skills gap by reducing red tape and increasing access to apprenticeship for young people across the province. We have heard from employers across Ontario that the previous Liberal government's approach was to place an undue amount of red tape on businesses, hampering businesses' ability to create high-quality jobs and stalling the province's economic growth. We want to make it easier for individuals to join the trades, and the complex, convoluted and constraining system currently in place does the opposite. The Making Ontario Open for Business Act, if passed, Response. will be a step forward in delivering on our promise to help fill the skills gap by increasing access to apprenticeships. Our government Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Order. Start the clock. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. I am proud for the first time in 15 years, Ontario has a government which understands that skilled trades are high quality and desirable jobs. It's taking action to make Ontario open for business here, here. and helping our young people prepare for successful careers in skilled trades. It is great news that our government is taking immediate action to reduce red tape on our job creators. I also know that we need to do more to ensure that the training of young people to create a career in the skilled trades is available and accessible, ensuring that there are people to fill the jobs Ontario's businesses will create. I understand that our government made a recent announcement that will help young people develop trade-specific knowledge and work experience to support them being hired as apprentices. Can the minister outline the steps our government is taking to create better jobs in Ontario? Minister. Thank you, Speaker. Our government promised to create good jobs for the people of Ontario, and my focus as Minister of Training, Colleges and University is ensuring that the people of Ontario get the skills they need for those jobs. Speaker, our government recently announced an investment of $13.2 million to provide pre-apprenticeship training to approximately 1,200 people. Training, training is delivered through organizations like colleges or community agencies across Ontario, and applications for funding to deliver programs are now open. Programs often combine level one apprenticeship training with a work placement and provide materials like tools and textbooks. The program is specifically tailored for young people who have left high school or have graduated high school but are not attending college. 
and I encourage organizations to apply to provide the programming so that young people in their community Spots. have an opportunity to access training. Speaker, our government promised to make Ontario open for business and create good jobs for the people of Ontario. Promise made. Pro Stop the clock. Order. Order. Start the clock. The member for Windsor West. My question is to the Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities. Windsor residents and businesses were shocked to learn that the Ford government is pulling the plug on the plan to establish a new law school in the Paul Martin building downtown. The provincial Liberals dragged their feet for five years before finally committing the funding needed. And the community thought the project would now become a reality. This was a unique opportunity for federal, municipal and provincial governments to work together with you, Windsor, and community partners to create a downtown experience for students while also boosting the local economy. Now everyone is at the table, except for the province. Is the Conservative government comfortable with being the reason this project will fail? Mr. Training Colleges and Universities. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. Speaker, we promised the people of Ontario to restore accountability and trust in Ontario's finances. The project a member identified was announced by the previous Liberal government before obtaining the necessary ministry approvals and the full authority of Cabinet. Speaker, this is ultimately indicative of why the Liberals' mismanagement of Ontario's finances hurts communities. In an election year, they made empty promises to Ontarians for programs and projects they could not afford, and they hid the costs from the public. What? The true deficit in the Liberals' 2018 budget was $15 billion. We owe it to our children, our grandchildren, and their children to fix this mess. Thank you, Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Minister. There is a lot of community support for moving the law school to the Paul Martin Building downtown. By relocating the school and its 800 students, faculty and staff to the Paul Martin Building, local businesses and community organizations were looking forward to the economic growth the move would generate. We also know that getting more students and young professionals into the downtown core will contribute to the continued revitalization and prosperity of our community. In the provincial election, the PCs even campaigned on this issue locally. Promise made, promise broken. Whose accountability is in question now? Why is the Ford government breaking this promise and choosing to see the Paul Martin building collect dust rather than contributing to a project that will revitalize our downtown core? Minister. Speaker, I want to remind the member opposite about the state of Ontario's finances and the importance of returning Ontario to sound financial footing. Speaker, we know, thanks to the Independent Commission of Inquiry, that our government needs to take action. The inquiry found that the Liberals made empty promises to Ontarians for programs and projects that they knew they could not afford, creating a $15 billion deficit. Order. And to make matters worse, we know from the Select Committee on Financial Transparency, Transparency that senior public servants warned the government that their plan could, quote, quote, could put pressure on the province's credit rating and overall bor borrowing capacity, unquote. Speaker, Ontarians know they can't trust the Liberals to manage the province's finances, and they cannot count on the NDP Response. to make the tough decisions to get Ontario back right. on sound financial footing. Speaker, we promised the people of Ontario to restore accountability and trust in Ontario's finances, and that's exactly what Stop the clock. Next question, start the clock. <laughs> Member for Sault Ste. Marie. Hey. Thank, 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Finance. Since the day we were elected, our government has a strong mandate to get this province back on the right track. This means responsible policy making, Mr. Speaker, and certainly responsible policy decisions to Northern Ontario's transportation is vital. Be it for people commuting to work, to school, or trying to get around, people deserve to have reliable transportation that allows them the freedom to pursue new opportunities and, and to ensure businesses can get products to market. This is why our government is committed to enhancing transportation services to help unlock the potential that we have in the North and to ensure that Northern Ontario is open for business. Can the minister please tell the members of this House why Northern transportation is such a key issue for our government? Minister of Finance. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to uh, my fellow Northern member from Sault Ste. Marie. Northern communities rely on dependable transportation to support jobs and grow the economy. Without reliable transportation, northern communities cannot move people and goods effectively and efficiently. While the North was neglected by the previous government, we can be sure that the North now has an ally in the Government of Ontario and in Premier Ford. We are committed to giving the North the support that has been missing for far too long. We have an opportunity, and, Speaker, we have a responsibility to open up the vast region of Northern Ontario and support our communities as they create jobs and build a strong economy. Supporting transportation services in Northern Ontario Response. is just one of the many ways we are making Ontario open for business. Stop the clock. Start the clock. Supplementary, the member for Perry Sound, Muskoka. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank you to the minister for your leadership on this important file. It makes me proud that Northern Ontario can count on our government to make the right choices that will bring economic prosperity to the region. People and businesses in the North, North need to move goods around the province, and I'm proud that our government is taking concrete action on this. I would also like to thank the Minister of Energy, Northern Development and Mines, who has taken a strong leadership role in protecting our northern residents. <laughs> Last week, Mr. Speaker, the government made a crucial announcement of support for northern transportation. Can the minister tell the members of this House about the details of this crucial announcement that highlight our commitment to supporting reliable and safe transportation options in the north? <laughs> Minister of Finance. Minister of Energy, Northern Development and Mines. Thank you. Minister of Energy, Northern Development and Mines. So excited. Th thank, you. thank you, Mr. Speaker, for that question for the member from Perry Sound and Muskoka. Uh, and to our all-star parliamentary assistant for Northern Development and Mines and Indigenous oh, Affairs for the important work he is doing in Sault Ste. Marie. He understands the importance of delivering product in and out of Northern Ontario, Mr. Speaker. Algoma in Sault Ste. Marie, ACOM in the Nair Centre in Domtar and Espanola. These are principal companies that rely on the Huron Central Railway to move product in and out of our vast region, Mr. Speaker. We said in the, in, on June 7th that we would stand up and create jobs and, as importantly, protect jobs. Mr. Speaker, this is a promise made. And we're going to continue to fight for new jobs in Northern Ontario because Northern Ontario, Mr. Speaker, is open for business. Order. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Ottawa Centre. Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Attorney General this morning, and in asking this question, Speaker, I want to rise to the Premier's challenge earlier today to find our people in Ontario cost savings. I have a question. I have an answer for you, Premier and, and Minister. Sitting over there in the Members' Gallery, Speaker, sure. spilling over there in the Members' Gallery, Speaker, are pro bono Ontario lawyers that save the public five million dollars a year. Right over there. But what we found out. 
is that on December 14, three law help centres that these courageous folks run will be closed. And people back in Ottawa Centre, Speaker, like Lori Shepherd, a constituent and mother of two who had nowhere to turn, went to people like this when her husband died without leaving a will. Lori told me that, quote, once I entered Pro Bono Ontario's office, life began to change. If I had not been introduced to Pro Bono Ontario, I would have gone deeper into debt and had my head well below water. Does the Attorney General believe that everyone deserves access to justice? Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member opposite for the question. I also would like to welcome the members of Pro Bono Ontario to the House today. As you know, Mr. Speaker, and as the Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities just said so eloquently, the previous Liberal government left our province and left the people of Ontario with a $15 billion deficit to pay back and more than $320 billion of debt to pay back, Mr. Speaker. And our government was elected with a strong mandate. Seventy-six of us were sent to this House, Mr. Speaker, to restore fiscal integrity to the province of Ontario so we can get back on a path to prosperity. Mr. Mr. Speaker, our government understands and values the work that Pro Bono Ontario does, and that is. Thank you. Supplementary, the member for Toronto Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Attorney General. Speaker. Pro Bono Ontario's Law Help Centres save this province money while providing necessary services to Ontarians, and it's a critical service that's provided in my riding in Toronto Centre as well. By providing advice on navigating the legal system, from helping clients fill out the correct form, uh, every dollar invested in pro, in pro Bono saves this province 10. Pro Bono has called upon the Attorney General to provide emergency funding of $500,000 in order to keep providing this valuable service. With it, the government can restore hope to people like Lori, who are at risk of losing their homes because they can't navigate the system with their creditors. Looking the other way while these centres are forced to close is penny-wise and pound-foolish. Will the Attorney General commit to permanent, Question. stable funding for the law help centres? Attorney General. Mr. Speaker, I can assure the member opposite that the last thing I have been doing and members of my ministry have been doing is looking the other way. The members of Pro Bono Ontario know that I have met with them, and my ministry and members of my staff have met with Pro Bono Ontario numerous times to help them work with Order. justice partners in the private sector, with the Law Society of Ontario, with the Law Foundation of Ontario, with other justice partners to make sure that they can provide the services that they provide in a sustainable way. And in fact, members of my staff are meeting with Pro Bono Ontario, are meeting with justice partners on this topic again this week. We want to work with the board of Pro Bono Ontario Member for Waterloo to fulfill come its mandate to deliver these services to the people of Ontario. Order. Start the clock. Next question. Member for Mississauga, Aaron Mills. Mr. Speaker, last week I was at the Empire Club of Canada to watch our very own President of the Treasury Board giving an impassioned speech about Ontario finance to a backed room. My constituents are very concerned about how years of liberal mismanagement have saddened future generations of Ontarians with an unbearable debt load. This is why our government has been working tirelessly to transform, modernize, and reduce wasteful spending. In fact, at one point, the leader of the opposition was against government waste too, going so far as to say in 2014, she wanted to appoint a savings and accountability minister. Can the President of the Treasury Board please inform the House about his initiatives to reduce waste for the benefit of taxpayers? The President of the Treasury Board. Hey. 
Well, Mr. Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition can rest assured that we already have a Minister of Savings and Accountability. It's called the President of the Treasury. Here, here, here. My speech was called The Challenge of a Generation, Building a Modern and Sustainable Government. Mr. Speaker, we are faced today with dire straits. If we let government spending and debt continue to grow unchecked, we will rob our children and future generations from the core services that they need to pr prosper. Mr. The Minister of Finance this week will outline through his fall economic statement the steps that we are taking to tackle the fiscal challenges Response. before us, Mr. Speaker. We will continue to put the people at the centre of every service, every policy, every province. That's our promise to the people of Ontario. Yeah. Restart the clock. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thanks for you, uh, the President of the Treasury Board, for this reply. It was refreshing to hear that the President of the Treasury Board say that we will measure success not by dollars spent, but by the outcome. The opposition has said that they can't imagine where the government is going to find efficiencies. Yet, I have an article here from 2004 that quotes the leader of the opposition as saying, quote, I actually believe that there is a lot of waste inside government right now. Or another quote, there is a lot of waste in the system. I know that's for sure. It is clear that we have here a real memory deficit. Can the president of the Treasury Board Tell the House about how government is counting the binnies. The member for King Vaughan come to order. Minister. Well, thank you. Um, these questions are pretty tough, Mr. Speaker, but I'll try my best. I'd like to thank the member from Mississauga, Aaron Mills, for that uh, question. In fact, the Leader of the Opposition uh, said, I'm the sort of new Democrat who also believes we need to count the pennies. Yeah. Well, I look forward to the Opposition's support, as I have directed my ministry to adopt a paperless approach to, meet to meetings to reduce waste. This has resulted so far in not only uh, significant dollar savings, but the savings of 17 trees and a reduction of 54 metric tons of greenhouse gas emissions, which I'm sure the Minister Absolutely. of Environment would like. Tree at a time. Mr. Thank Speaker, you. we are not just tweeting, we are doing. After all, the proper management of public finances is not just a fiscal Member for Waterloo, come to order. Speaker, the management of the finances is also Response. a moral imperative. Yep. That is why we are doing this for the people. Order. Order. Start the clock. The next mem member for London North Centre. Next question. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Labour. This government's attack on Bill 148 has come to a sh as a shock to the working people of London North Centre, who are counting on the $15 minimum wage increase. One of my constituents, Roseanne Perry, told me how low wages forced her to work multiple jobs simply so she could pay her rent. These jobs gave her some financial security, but the long hours at multiple jobs meant she had no time to visit family, friends, and it took a toll on her overall mental health. <clears throat> The London Poverty Research Centre found that half of Londoners are working in non-standard or unstable jobs. Half. These Londoners and working families across the province were counting on the $15 minimum wage to improve their financial stability and quality of life. This government needs to show real compassion and talk to people about a living wage and not dealing in bumper sticker slogans. Instead of dealing with the working people of this province, this government locks its office doors and calls the police on its own constituents, and we call shame. When is this government going to listen Question. to working people in Ontario? Minister of Labour. Minister of Labour. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, look, we did listen to the people of Ontario, and what they said back is they want more jobs in the province of Ontario, better paying jobs in the province of Ontario. What we saw under the previous Liberal government, supported by the NDP government, was job losses. First month out after Bill 148 was brought up, over 50,000 job losses, 80,000 job losses in order. August alone Opposition because come of to bad order. legislation that prevented businesses from creating those jobs. So, Mr. Speaker, we're going to make better paying jobs in the province of Ontario okay. so everybody's constituents can have a good job. That concludes the time that we have for question period this morning. The Minister of Children, Community and Social Services has a point of order. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. I seek unanimous consent to move a motion without notice regarding the collection of shoebox donation gifts of love for women impacted by homelessness and fleeing violence for the shoebox project in members' offices. Minister of Children, Community and Social Services is seeking unanimous consent of the House to move a motion. Agreed. Agree. Agree. Recognize the Minister of Children, Community and Social Be allowed to collect donations for the Shoebox Project to help women impacted by homelessness and fleeing violence in their offices and constituency offices for the remainder of the fall legislative sitting. Order. Member for Hamilton Mountain, the Minister, the Minister of Natural Resources, come to order. Ms. McLeod has moved that members be allowed to collect donations for the shoebox project to help women impacted by homelessness and fleeing violence in their offices and constituency offices for the remainder of the fall legislative sitting. Is it the pleasure of the House of the motion carried? Carried. Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member for London Fanshawe has given notice of her dissatisfaction with the answer to her question given by the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care concerning long-term care virtual beds. This matter will be debated tomorrow at 6 p.m. Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member for Ottawa Centre has given notice of his dissatisfaction with the answer to his question given by the Attorney General concerning pro bono Ontario funding. This matter will be debated Wednesday at 6 p.m. We have a deferred vote on the amendment to Government Notice of Motion No. 15 relating to allocation of time on Bill 47, an act to amend the Employment Standards Act 2000, Labour Relations Act 1995, and the Ontario College of Trades and Apprenticeship Act 2009, and make complementary amendments to other acts. Call in the members. This will be a five-minute bell.
can I ask members to please take their seats. Would the members please take their seats? On November the 1st, 2018, Ms. Armstrong moved an amendment to government notice of motion number 15 relating to allocation of time on Bill 47. All those in favour of Ms. Armstrong's motion will please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Madame Jelena. Madame Jelena. Mr. Tab. Mr. Tab. Mr. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Shaw. Ms. Shaw. Mr. Mamakwa. Mr. Mamakwa. Mr. Yard. Mr. Yard. Ms. Carpoche. Ms. Carpoche. Mr. Manta. Mr. Manta. Ms. Styles. Ms. Styles. Mr. Kernahan. Mr. Kernahan. Mr. West. Mr. West. Mrs. Stevens. Mrs. Stevens. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Andrew. Ms. Andrew. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Birch. Mr. Birch. Ms. Burns McGowan. Ms. Burns McGowan. Mr. Arthur. Mr. Arthur. Ms. Bell. Ms. Bell. Mr. Glover. Mr. Glover. Ms. Morrison. Ms. Morrison. Mr. Rakosovic. Mr. Rakosovic. Mr. Harden. Mr. Harden. Ms. Monteith Farrell. Ms. Monteith Farrell. Mr. Hassan. Mr. Hassan. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Madame de Rosie. Madame de Rosie. Mr. Shrine. Mr. Shrine. All those opposed to Ms. Armstrong's motion will please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Smith, Bay of Quinty. Mr. Smith, Bay of Quinty. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Bethlehem Falls. Mr. Bethlehem Falls. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Ford. Mr. Ford. Ms. Elliott. Ms. Elliott. Mr. Yurek. Mr. Yurek. Ms. McLeod. Ms. McLeod. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Hardeman. Mr. Hardeman. Mr. Tabolo. Mr. Tabolo. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Pettipe. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Fullerton. Mr. Fullerton. Mr. Scott. Mr. Scott. Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones. Mr. Cho Scarborough North. Mr. Cho Scarborough North. Mr. Rickford. Mr. Rickford. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Miller. Perry Samuskoka. Mr. Miller. Perry Samuskoka. Mr. Letcher. Mr. Letcher. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Downey. Mr. Downey. Mr. Gill. Mr. Gill. Mr. Cook. Mr. Cook. Mr. Kalanda. Mr. Kalanda. Mr. Sermon. Mr. Sermon. Mr. Parson. Mr. Parson. Mr. Skelly. Mr. Skelly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Sarkari. Mr. Sarkari. Mr. Ostrom. Mr. Ostrom. Ms. Park. Ms. Park. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Kusindova. Mr. Kusindova. Mr. Romano. Mr. Romano. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Mrs. Carahalia. Mrs. Carahalia. Mrs. Fee. Mrs. Fee. Mr. Cho Willowdale. Mr. Cho Willowdale. Mr. Smith. Peterborough Court. Mr. Smith. Peterborough Court. Ms. Kanji. Ms. Kanji. Mr. Pacini. Mr. Pacini. Mr. Cram. Mr. Cram. Mrs. Y. Mrs. Y. Mrs. Tangri. Mrs. Tangri. Mademoiselle Samar. Mademoiselle Samar. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Sandu. Mr. Sandu. Mr. Crawford. Mr. Crawford. Mr. Bauma. Mr. Bauma. Ms. McKenna. Ms. McKenna. Ms. Dunlop. Ms. Dunlop. Mr. Kanapati. Mr. Kanapati. Mr. Babikian. Mr. Babikian. Mr. Babber. Mr. Babber. Mr. Pang. Mr. Pang. Mr. Tanigasi. Mr. Tanigasi. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Cazetto. Mr. Cazetto. Mr. Sabawi. Mr. Sabawi. The ayes are 37, the nays are 68. The ayes being 37, the nays being 68, I declare the motion lost. Mr. Smith, Bay of Quinty, has moved government notice of motion number 15 relating to allocation of time on Bill 47, an act to amend the Employment Standards Act 2000, the Labour Relations Act 1995, and the Ontario College of Trades and Apprenticeships Act 2009, and make complementary amendments to other acts. Is it the pleasure of the House that the motion carry? Yeah. I heard many no's. All those in favour of the motion will please say aye. aye. All those opposed will please say nay. Yeah. In my opinion, the ayes have it. Call in the members. This will be a five-minute bell.
Mr. Smith Bay of Quinte has moved Government Notice of Motion No. 15 relating to allocation of time on Bill 47. All those in favour of the motion will please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Smith Bay of Quinte. Mr. Smith Bay of Quinte. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Bethlehem Fowler. Mr. Bethlehem Fowler. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Ford. Mr. Ford. Ms. Elliott. Ms. Elliott. Mr. Yurick. Mr. Yurick. Ms. Mulroney. Ms. Mulroney. Ms. McLeod. Ms. McLeod. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Harder. Mr. Harder. Mr. Tabola. Mr. Tabola. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Pettipe. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaught. Ms. Fullerton. Ms. Fullerton. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mr. Cho Scarborough North. Mr. Cho Scarborough North. Mr. Rickford. Mr. Rickford. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Miller Perry Salmascoca. Mr. Miller Perry Salmascoca. Mr. Lecce. Mr. Lecce. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Downey. Mr. Downey. Mr. Gill. Mr. Gill. Mr. Cook. Mr. Cook. Mr. Kalan. Mr. Kalan. Mr. Serma. Mr. Serma. Mr. Parsons. Mr. Parsons. Mr. Skelly. Mr. Skelly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Triantafilopoulos. Mr. Triantafilopoulos. Mr. Sarkari. Mr. Sarkari. Mr. Ostra. Mr. Ostra. Mr. Park. Mr. Park. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Ms. Kusendova. Ms. Kusendova. Mr. Romano. Mr. Romano. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Mrs. Carahalios. Mrs. Carahalios. Mrs. Fee. Mrs. Fee. Mr. Cho Willowdale. Mr. Cho Willowdale. Mr. Smith Peterborough Court. Mr. Smith Peterborough Court. Mr. Kanji. Mr. Kanji. Mr. Pacini. Mr. Pacini. Mr. Cramp. Mr. Cramp. Mrs. Y. Mrs. Y. Mrs. Tang. Mrs. Tang. Mademoiselle Samar. Mademoiselle Samar. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Sandy. Mr. Sandy. Mr. Crawford. Mr. Crawford. Mr. Bauma. Mr. Bauma. Mr. McKenna. Mr. McKenna. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. Canapati. Mr. Canapati. Mr. Babiki. Mr. Babiki. Mr. Baber. Mr. Baber. Mr. Pang. Mr. Pang. Mr. Tani Gasly. Mr. Tani Gasly. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Cusetto. Cusetto. Mr. Cusetto. Mr. Sabawi. Mr. Sabawi. All those opposed to the motion will please rise one at a time and be counted by the clerk. Monsieur Bisson. Monsieur Bisson. Madame Jelena. Madame Jelena. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Mr. Natashak. Mr. Natashak. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Shaw. Ms. Shaw. Mr. Mamakwa. Mr. Mamakwa. Mr. Yard. Mr. Yard. Ms. Carpoche. Mr. Carpoche. Mr. Manta. Mr. Manta. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Stiles. Ms. Stiles. Mr. Kernahan. Mr. Kernahan. Mr. West. Mr. West. Mrs. Stevens. Mrs. Stevens. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Andrew. Ms. Andrew. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Birch. Mr. Birch. Mr. Burns McGowan. Mr. Burns McGowan. Mr. Arthur. Mr. Arthur. Ms. Bell. Ms. Bell. Mr. Glover. Mr. Glover. Ms. Morrison. Ms. Morrison. Mr. Rokosov. Mr. Rokosov. Mr. Harden. Mr. Harden. Ms. Monteith Farrell. Ms. Monteith Farrell. Mr. Hassan. Mr. Hassan. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Madame de Rosier. Madame de Rosier. Mr. Schreiner. Mr. Schreiner. The ayes are 70, the nays are 37. The ayes being 70, the nays being 37, I declare the motion carried. Yeah. Member for Hamilton East, Stony Creek. Hey. Speaker, uh, I'd just like to uh, Congratulate the Hamilton Tiger Cats for their defeat of the BC Lions, and next week we're coming for those Ottawa Red Blacks. I don't think we're going to have a debate on that, at least not right now. This House stands in recess until 1 p.m.